Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed, December, Q&A time, part one. Not much more to say, so let's get into it. But before we do, today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Antec and their Performance One Full Tower EATX case. Designed to support the latest RTX 40 series graphics cards up to 400 millimeters long, the P1 is big on the inside with loads of options for top and front mounted radiators, including the ability to support dual 360 millimeter radiators simultaneously. The P1 comes with four pre-installed Storm T3 PWM fans with the ability to expand fan support to an additional six. It includes a temperature display, dual 4mm tempered glass side panels, cable management covers complete with Velcro straps for quick and easy cable management, and now also comes in a very clean white version. Exclusive to Amazon US, there are some excellent Christmas discounts available, so for more information, please check the link in the video description. All right, would the 7900 XT at $900 be as bad if it hadn't been undercut by the $1,000 XTX? So we're talking about, I imagine, launch day reviews, day one reviews of these products. Mm -hmm. If there wasn't an XTX or the XTX was much closer to the RTX 4080 mm -hmm. in terms of pricing or just offered the same cost per frame as the 7900 XT... Or if it launched later, because if you produced the review first and then the other sure, card came yep. out later, it would have been different as well. Would the XT have been, uh, well, better received or, or less bad? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it would have helped for sure, because obviously it made it a pointless product, because if you're interested in a 7900 series product, you would just buy the XTX because it offered much better cost per frame uh, for $100 more. So it would have helped in that sense. Would it have made it... So I guess, yeah, would it have been as bad? Well, I guess the simple answer there is no. It wouldn't have been as bad because one of the dumbest things about it was the XTX being better value. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't have made it necessarily a positive review, mm. um, more positive. <laughs> like, from memory, you're looking at RTX 3080 cost per frame uh, from right. a similar XT. Which I know you couldn't really buy the 3080, so there's all that. Uh, but even so, like just matching what the previous generation offered in terms of value is not amazing, even if the previous generation you couldn't really buy because cryptocurrency mining and all that. So towards the end of its life, it did get much closer to the MSRP. So at the time, yeah, you're that's buying right. it, I guess they were starting to be discontinued at that point because NVIDIA was moving to the next generation. But you. It was more like a seven hundred dollar GPU around the time that it launched. So if it came out with, oh, here's the another product of a similar cost per frame, it's not exactly moving the needle too much for that specific time. But yeah, if you were comparing it to like mid twenty twenty one, it'd be a very different proposition because those cards were not seven hundred dollars US. Yeah, and I think the big problem. So that's the MSRP discussion of the re review, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, it does improve that the. Big problem we would have with the 7900 XT and really most or almost all current generation GPUs is the outgoing stuff. Mm -hmm. And look, we get that when a new generation comes in, that means the existing products, they're now tier two, they're, they're, they're previous generation parts, they get discounted, fire sales happen. And so it's, it's, it's a bit unfair to compare new products with the outgoing products because mm -hmm. they're always going to offer better value. But typically they're not significantly better like they are better value and typically it's a very limited run thing like it, it's, yeah they'll sell out in like two weeks yeah it's over and done with before you know about it but months uh and possibly even still up until this very day <laughs> you had stuff like the 6800 xts and the 7900 xt in terms of cost per frame was from memory it was almost like 30 percent more expensive let's say 25 percent more expensive it's a 25 percent premium for the new generation, which didn't really offer much. And that, that we're talking about cost per frame there as well. So it's it's an actual increase per frame. So that's bad. Mm. Uh, and that and that's why ultimately the 1700 XT would have been hard to get excited about, even if the XTX you know, was released later. Yeah, it's clearly priced based on, at least in my opinion, they looked at the spec sheet. They're like, we've cut down roughly 10% of the cores. Mm -hmm. Let's ignore the other parts of the hardware. 10% of the cores... And so we'll make it 10% cheaper. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't sufficient for that sort of product. Um, so, yeah, the XTX looked a little better. Um, but, yeah, just the pricing there didn't didn't make a lot of sense. And, it, yeah, as you sort of pointed out, even without those sort of that price pressure from the, the higher tier model, 
I don't think you probably would have recommended it too strongly. No. All right, we're going to do a bit of a specs on personal rigs update by the sounds mm-hmm. of it. We get these every now and then, so I guess we are, we're going for it, Tim. So sure. what are the specs of your personal rigs and how often do you all upgrade? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I actually haven't upgraded mine for a while. I've sort of been waiting for... Well, they've now been released, the Threadripper 7000 series to Mm -hmm. to come out. It'll probably be my next big upgrade. So at the moment, I'm using 3970X as Zen 2. So obviously, the Zen 4 upgrade is going to be pretty significant in terms of performance. Um, That's on like an... It's an Asus TRX40 Prime S or Pro S or something motherboard. One of of those boards. I used the MSI Creator, I think it was. Yeah. So I've got the Asus version of effectively that. 128 gig of DDR4 memory. Can't remember the you know you're running at something fairly slow across all all the DIMM slots that are populated there. And then I'm using the GeForce RTX 3090 in my my system at the moment. Probably should switch that over to AMD because I'm having even more display issues than usual at the moment. And oh. then I've just got like a couple of SSDs. I think I've got like a Sabrent Rocket is like my primary drive and like a Samsung nine something Pro. And I've got like a I think it's like an 850 or 1000 watt PSU. It's probably a Again, 980 Pro or something like that. Yeah, so it's a lot of those specs are sort of not super fresh in my mind because that system has not been updated significantly in a few we years built now. Them on, we built that system on the channel, didn't we, in a live stream? I think so. I think some of the things have been swapped in, like okay. a few changes here okay. and there. I think like the cooler, I've, I've swapped that for like a beefier Noctua model. I'm just using Noctua air cooling in it. So it's like the yeah, I did the, same. the, the bigger version mm. of the, the TR trx 40 coolers that they offer Mm -hmm. and yeah so obviously if i was doing a new build i'd probably yeah upgrade a few things the gpu you know it's a quite a power consuming system so getting the same performance i could get a much more efficient gpu providing pretty much the same performance or consider switching to amd if you know a 40 series gpu wasn't solved some of the the display things that we've talked about in the podcast lately so yeah i think my system is definitely due for an upgrade so what's your system rocking at the moment well it sounds like to up answer the uh how often do we upgrade part mm-hmm. at least in more recent times I upgrade much more often than you do but mm-hmm. i don't have a regular upgrade cycle but then who does i suppose it's just yeah. like whenever it sort yeah. of makes sense or when there's something interesting that comes along so i had pretty much the same system as tim with a few mm-hmm. differences with motherboard and stuff like that but i built it on the main channel it stayed pretty much you know as we built it back then uh, and then in that time, we got a full-time video editor for the last two years, Balin. So he needed a system. So I, I was going to upgrade to the uh, the 5995WX Threadripper workstation from my 3970X. Uh, but I gave that to Balin to use and we had nothing but problems. Complete, not a nightmare. We persevered for like six months. We wasted so much time with it. So in the end, I decided to build a 7950X 3D AM5 mm-hmm. system. We loaded that with tons of memory. That worked really well. Great for scrubbing through timelines. It encoded at a reasonably good pace. So he was happy with that. And I used it a few times and I thought, hmm, this seems faster than my Threadripper system. So I went and purchased a 7950X 3D and upgraded my Threadripper 3970X to that. So along with that, I I used the Asus ROG Strix X670E-A gaming Wi-Fi because I had that from the big board roundup I did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's sort of, it's got a lot of white and silver highlights on it. So I used that because I wanted to make this themed because we got some B-roll from it. This is <laughs> for your workstation. Cool. <laughs> you need that white workstation build. You're uh, the only person uh, doing uh, that. It was for the B-roll as well. And it oh. looks good. Looks good. Tim, if you can, y- you should. So I'm All saying. right. And then I've got my RGB lighting on default. Yeah, see, you got to... <laughs> it's rainbow, I think. <laughs> we'll get some B-roll of your computer, mm-hmm. um, which we're definitely not going to get. But if we don't get it, it's because Tim didn't provide it because he was too <laughs> embarrassed about his rainbow puke RGB. It's and not then... synchronized at all. I don't use any of those apps. <laughs> You're an embarrassment. Mm-hmm. No, I'm joking, of course. Uh, then I'm using the Sapphire Radeon RX 6950 XT Nitro Plus Pure Graphics Card because we had that and I had multiple 6950 XTs. So I need one for testing. So I'm like, I'll just chuck that in my system and it's worked a treat. Um, I had that in the Threadripper system as well. So I just mm-hmm. carried that on over because it worked really well. I've got the Deep Cool LS720 ARGB 360mm AIO CPU cooler. 
and that I purchased myself and that's been working very well. I bought that when I built the system because it's white. I got the white version, important detail. Cool. Um, I've got 64 gigabytes of DDR5 6000 cell 30 memory, which isn't white, but it looks fine. Um, bit of an oversight cool. there on the yeah. design team, but you know. Well, the B-roll, yeah, that you'll be getting people will be embarrassed there too. No, they. I think they'll they'll let that slide because of how right. good the system looks overall. Um, I've got an MSI. Uh, what is it? Spa- spatium? 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 I would have thought it's spatium, but I think they say spatium. How do we? Spa- spa- spatium. I, spatium. Are you there, Balin? Spatium. Yeah. How do you say it? Spatium. Spatium. He says spatium. So if that's wrong, MSI. Balan's, you know, mm-hmm. downgrade your system. It's always good when you have a product name that's easy to pronounce, like sp- spati- Spatium. Yes. Love it. Yes. The monitor division probably had something to do with that. <laughs> it, anyway, it's the to move on is the M641 SSD, four terabyte model. I purchased it myself. I got it because it's very cheap. It's currently $350 Australian. Mm, I should get a few of those. Uh, yeah, and it works really well. I mean, I use it as a boot drive uh, and I've had... Computer super duper snappy. Cool. Copies things really quickly to my external storage, like this camera, which will have like 400 gigabytes of what's that camera, the black magic thing or whatever. Yeah, lots of B roll. Lots of, lots of stuff. Uh, and this is in the Height Y40 case, mm-hmm. which I'd never ever used their stuff before. And I love that case. It's amazing. I actually have the white Y70 sitting over there. And I've got the new MSI. Nope, scrap that. I've got the new Gigabyte X670 board that's white. Cool. So I was going to stick that in the new Y70 and then rebuild that rig into there just cause. Cool. Um, oh, and I have the MSI Meg AI. We've got an AI product. AI, cool. AI 1300p. So it's a 1300 watt ATX3. It's got you know, the 12 mm-hmm. pin high powered connector. I think it might even have two of them. Anyway. It's overkill for, for my needs, uh, but I had that, and it's a really good power supply. So I chucked it. It's not it's not white, but you don't, can't see it in the case. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm... Does that mean it has black cables? I'm not sure. I think I got white extension cables. <laughs> well, you'll see in the B-roll that people have probably already seen, Tim. Right. I it's, just, it's just funny to me that you built a workstation, which... Most people just build with like, you can have a green PCB in there, it doesn't matter, but you've gone like full aesthetic build for your workstation. My workstation's under the desk, I never see it. Well, Same with my gaming build. Mine's not. Mine's the mm-hmm. first thing you see when you come to the office, but to call mine a workstation these days is generous mm-hmm. because I use Chrome and Excel. Right. So you've built a glorified Chromebook. Yes. But it's. A workstation, well, but it's an aesthetic build. It's a it's an emergency PC because Balin does he edits all of the videos now. Mm-hmm. So unless he's sick or you know I let him have a holiday, which I try not to do that, um, I have to then edit a video so I can use my workstation. So it's a workstation for a couple right. of weeks of the year. Okay, so just don't just go easy on it. All right, all right, all right. Let's move on. Can you comment on Steam's one active account policy? It seems out of date and anti-consumer. What are your thoughts? Many gamers are getting to the age where we have kids and our second baby, a library of games. My kiddo wants to play some of my games or I want to use my Steam account to buy games he wants, but only one computer can be actively using only one game from my account at a time. I think this really needs to get some traction. So, yeah, I think... I guess there's a balancing act with something like this. Like, I have a library of, like, I don't know, 500 games or something on Steam. Obviously, mm. a lot of those I use for testing. Now, if it was only one person could be using one game at a time, but that anyone could be playing any of my games, but only, you know, one game per person, then I could theoretically have 500 users using my account, which I think Steam would probably not be overly keen on. But then one person, like... One person seems a bit limited to me. Like if I've yeah. bought 500 games, surely more than one person could be using like one person be playing Starfield while another person's playing The Witcher, another person's playing Cyberpunk, another person's playing Call of Duty, all on my account. I think that would make a lot more sense because like, you know, you can get Netflix accounts and all those sort of like streaming apps where you can have family plans and family profiles so that multiple people can use them. So I think that, yeah, that the policy does seem a little outdated to me. But I don't think it should be, you know, 500 people using No, two or three games. is reasonable. It's worse. 
the Netflix comparison for Steam because you're phys- you're paying for the game. Yeah, you're, that's right. You're not paying to subscribe to access to games. Now, I know the game developers would come back and say, well, you're not buying the game. You're buying a license to use our software, technically speaking, or, mm. you know, oh, you know, we can take... Because they, they've removed games from Steam and you've got no recourse. They just take it away. Yeah, that's right. Which is for online games. Yeah, which for anyone who's older than 12 is not a great argument because you used to actually buy the game. You used to buy, buy a physical disc. For the same money. Exactly. And you can still do yeah. that if you own like a, a console, like a PS5. Yeah. You can buy a physical game and once you're done with it, you can literally just give it to your friend mm-hmm. and they can play the game. Like there's, so, <laughs> there's no limitation there at yeah, all. Yeah, I, I totally agree with this, that this is something that could be improved. The problem we've got with it is the fact that Steam is pretty much one of the leading or best services for the convenience of logging in and doing all that sort of stuff. Like There is mm-hmm. stuff like Family View, which doesn't solve the problem, but... For example, what is it? Well, I don't even know what they... What is it? EA... What is the EA one now called? EA Play, EA I think. Play. It used to be Origin. Um, I try not to... I it's I really try it's, not it's to use it at all. Uh, Uconnect or whatever Ubisoft's one is. A um, few others. But basically, all of... Uh, Epic Game Store doesn't have this problem, but the, the Ubisoft and EA ones, you can only log in mm-hmm. to the software on one device at one time. So if you have... Which is, just to be clear, hilariously terrible. Awful. Terrible. So if you if you play games on your home PC and you play them on you know, well, your home gaming PC and maybe your home theatre PC as well, you do more casual gaming over there, mm-hmm. driving stuff, all that kind of... With Steam, you can have Steam installed on both of those systems, open mm-hmm. at the same time, and, you know, one can update and they can do, like, network sharing or they can both update. Essentially, if you leave it open, all your games should be updated at all times. With EA Play or whatever, you can only... You can have it installed on both systems, but you can only be logged in to one system. And if you log... Mm-hmm. So if you're logged in on your desktop and it's just sitting there idle with the, the store open and you log in on your home theater PC, it actually logs that one out. Mm-hmm. And it's not a, it's not as simple as going back over there and going, oh, that's annoying, log in. You have to actually type your username and password in oh, again. That's so bad. And then if you haven't logged out on the home theater PC before doing that, it then logs that out. And it's just this constant back and mm, forth. It's terrible. It's awful. And then if someone does log in there while you're gaming, it will boot you from the game, whereas Steam doesn't have that. And also, if you try to play a game, it'll warn you that someone's using the Steam account. You know, Do you want to continue or not? So... Again, while I think that that is something that would be a huge improvement to Steam and really something that Mm -hmm. we should be entitled to, I feel, like Steam users should probably be entitled to. Yeah, like I think there's a a better balancing act than what they've got at the moment. Yeah. Like there's got to be a scenario where I don't know if it's like, you know, they geofence it to a certain location so you can't just be like selling your account access to someone in another region, which would be obviously not ideal it should be more for like your your family or friends in your sort of local area you know there's probably some solution that they could come up with where yeah you could be playing you know your family members in your house can be playing a variety of your games on your account at the same time that's very reasonable it's very fair for developers and sort of yeah incentivizes people to build these big steam libraries especially because yeah there might be a game that you're not super interested in playing but the incentive would be you add it to your library you pay for it and then you know some someone else can be accessing yeah. even that the game. region thing it's like chances are if you're sharing with someone in the u.s or whatever you're not going to be gaming at the same time it's a yeah. bit very low overlap but boiling all this down it's it's as simple as nothing here is going to change unless a mm-hmm. huge percentage of steam users were fed up with it and you know, they wanted to see some change there because if there was a genuine competitor, and I mean, I mean, we talked in the podcast, uh, the podcast episode recently about how bad the Epic Game Store is, mm-hmm. and this feels like something that and and, and the know, Epic Game Store is much better than <laughs> yeah, EA well, Play and Ubisoft's crap. Well, that's true, but if they if they're coming up with like what's a unique feature, a unique selling point that would mm-hmm. get people to genuinely change their mind about Epic being horrible. It would be a feature like you can buy games and more than one person can be using your library at the same time. I'm not actually sure what Epic's policy is on that, but I can't imagine it's anyone can just play any game at the one time. It seems pretty unlikely. Mm-hmm. No, so, I'm, I'm pretty certain you can't. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I think that that would be something to bring competition to Steam that would make you know bring some incentives for the Epic Game Store. But the Epic Game Store is obviously missing even some pretty basic things that Steam has, so they should probably. <laughs> get those things working properly like 
installing and updating games is probably one of the things they should get right first. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But yeah, having two people be able to use the same account at the same time but not be able to play the exact same game but two separate games. Mm-hmm. That seems like that makes that sense. That would be a massive draw card. Like, yeah. I'd want to invest a lot of my money on the platform that offers that even if it had a lot of other shortcomings mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, I've got kids as well and it's really annoying when I buy, like, a $90 Australian, $100, $120 game and yeah, for example, the Avatar game was a recent one. I bought that for testing on my account. My daughter loves Avatar. So then I had to turn around and buy it for her on her account so she'd actually play it because I had mm-hmm. to do testing. So yeah, that's really annoying. <laughs> so Yeah, maybe if it's even like you you're within your family unit, you get a discount for buying like a second copy, like a significant discount. I mean that's that would be obviously you'd want it, full price. Yeah, I mean obviously it'd be ideal that they could just use it, but you know, if they're trying to balance up you know developers getting angry about all sorts of different things that's one potential option as well but yeah the current situation needs to be improved but as you say i don't think it will for various different reasons competition being the main one mm-hmm. given that amd is planning to release more am4 x3d cpus how long do you think the am4 platform will remain viable for use especially gaming so i guess the question is like at what point can i just like not use am4 anymore because it's just too slow it's not delivering mm-hmm playable frame rates and let's say that 60 fps in this example or acceptable frame rates i think is the terminology we landed on the podcast wasn't it yes i believe so yeah Yeah. Uh, acceptable frame rates for us is 60 plus um, because we are pc elitists if you didn't Mm -hmm. know so just want to make that clear to everyone watching well the 5800x 3d and i know core count comes up a lot in these topics which is still baffling to this day given how much actual scientific data there has been proves that core counts not really important it's about overall cpu performance and even that can be difficult to measure with stuff like 3d v cache and whatnot but really we know if you take a huge range of games let's say 30 plus games and then you take the average performance seen across those 30 plus games we know that like the 5800 x 3d lands somewhere around like a Ryzen 5 7600 slash Ryzen 7 7700. So the, the non-3DV mm-hmm. cache Zen 4 parts. It's about there. So in, a, in, in an example like a 5800X 3D, for that CPU not to be really usable anymore and pretty crap, you'd have to say the same about the 7600 and the 7700. Uh, unless the only thing that complicates this issue is like memory bandwidth, DDR4 to DDR5. But I think it's going to be a while before that's really a significant factor. So mm-hmm. CPU performance is similar to, to those. And then I guess when we are talking about AM4, we're primarily talking about the end of the road, which is the Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. And I think it's going to be quite a while before those CPUs are like not delivering 60 FPS in most games. I know there's probably like games like Hogwarts Legacy with ray tracing enabled and maybe staff although starfield performance has been improved quite a lot um Mm -hmm. cpu performance so i imagine they're doing over 60 fps now but yeah they're not gonna just fall off a cliff out of nowhere uh the cpus that they've always been roughly equal to will will phase out at the same time yeah would you say the best time to buy any graphics card is on release Uh, instead of waiting for sales maybe maximizing time with the product actually uh, offers the best value in terms of dollar per day of ownership. So should you buy the product right away the second it's out at presumably the MSRP full price or mm-hmm. hold out months hoping that there'll be a discount to get it a bit cheaper, but doing so means that you've had less time to actually enjoy the product and and mm-hmm. maximize your value, your time with that product. I would say, t- typically speaking, the way I would go about it is you wait for the competing or the the products around about like say for example we talked about earlier a 7900 xt at $900 if that launched but then a month later we we're getting the xtx which actually offered more of pretty much everything and was better value you would have been better off waiting a month to get that product so mm-hmm. there's a lot of it depends type stuff like waiting for the whole product cycle to come out at least the relevant products again in your price range Because it may be that the GeForce product is much better value than the Radeon GPU or vice versa. So you want to have all your options out there. But yeah, I would, once once you know, you got sort of the lay of the land, you know what's what, I would be inclined to purchase them, which is what a lot of people do. And that's why historically 
for at least a few weeks, if not a month after the initial release. You just can't buy the product, at least not at the MSRP. So like a product like the 3080, for example, you would have wanted to snap that up because the Radeon GPU, the 6800 XT, wasn't really any better. Yeah, the extra VRAM was certainly nice, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't have been kicking yourself. The GeForce GPU had some nice features and for $700, that was a good product. So you'd want to get that straight away. I think you can usually tell the products that will get discounts discounted more quickly than others. Mm -hmm. Like AMD, for example, is usually more willing to reduce prices than NVIDIA. So again, if you're more inclined to buy a Radeon GPU, maybe waiting a little bit longer is going to be more likely to get a price reduction, whereas a GeForce GPU is very unlikely, typically, to come yeah, down Yeah, that's price. right. And also the quality of the product, you know, 7900 XT, 7700 XT, 7600 were poor, more poorly priced at launch, which means it's more likely that they'll come down in price. Again, exacerbated by Radeon GPUs typically being a bit more flexible on price. But even then with NVIDIA, 4060 Ti's come down in price. The 4070 has been reduced in price a little to you know, because of competition reasons. So it's always just assessing things, right? Like, Well, all of those products were not recommended to buy. Well, exactly. There was alternatives recommended, so you shouldn't have even bought them initially anyway. That's true. That's yeah. true. But obviously, if you were very keen on one of those products for whatever reason, mm -hmm. then, yeah, a, a less likely to be a recommended product, you're probably better off waiting to, to get it the price down to a, a more reasonable level. But mm -hmm. I think the majority of the time, what you're saying makes the most sense. If it's a good product good value, worth buying, matches up well against the competition, and you've seen all the competition, it's all out, it's all, you've got all the information, then, yeah, waiting typically isn't going to bring you anything. You're better off just depends going how, for it. Yeah, simple equations you can do. It depends on how desperate you are for one. So you've got to weigh that up. Like, mm -hmm. is the product I got still getting me by, or is it like, it's just, I've held on for so long now, mm -hmm. this thing's barely usable, the experience is unenjoyable. At that point, you know, it's not worth waiting six months to try and save a hundred dollars because you end up saving bugger all money over that period of time. Like what's a hundred dollars US over six months to you? I guess you also have to work that out. But yeah, I mean, we see all the time people asking, oh, especially mid-generation people like, should I buy this card now? Or should I, like, I know the next generation is coming in six months or a year. Should yeah. I be buying now? You can always wait for a better product. Like That's a tough one. You yeah. can always wait. There's always going to be some amount of time you can wait to get something better. So I think, yeah, the, the closer you get to the start of the generation, the more it makes sense. Again, though, ultimately, only you can make that decision because you know what it is you're using and whether or not it's usable for what yeah, you're exactly. wanting to do. So. Can you put up with that thing for six more months to maybe get a much better product for the similar money? Or will six months of enjoyable mm -hmm. gaming offset that in terms of value? So Depends I on game releases as well. If there's yeah. like the big, the big, like there's Cyberpunk, for example, comes out. That's the big game you're waiting for and all your mates are playing. You want to get into the conversation and talk about playing that game. Mm. And you've got your slow GPU and you're sort of like, oh, I don't know if, if it's going to cope and I could wait six months to get something better that, but that means delaying playing the game until all my mates have already finished it. You know, those are the things that you have to weigh up as well. Like mm -hmm. that can play a big part of it is games you're interested in coming out. So, so many things to assess there. And yeah, as you say, it's only you that can answer that question. Mm -hmm. All right, Tim, is the Steam hardware survey reliable? Tell me mm -hmm. all about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always had... <laughs> It, I think it's a useful tool in some degree, but I'm not sure how reliable it is for like making any market share discussions and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a few question marks I have over it. Things like apparently not everyone gets surveyed every month. I rarely get one. Yeah, so I, I've only got it occasionally, which I think is kind of bizarre. Like I would have thought that Steam would just want to survey all Steam users instead of just randomly being like, do you want to do the survey or not? And they would just do it in the background and maybe you could opt out of providing the survey information because yep. it doesn't seem to me like it's overly personal information to submit the fact that you're using the, the hardware in your PC. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the fact that it's sort of sampled in some way that seems unclear to me, it, that's a bit bizarre. And I think that causes some of the fluctuations that we see from month to month, which is one of the things that I think probably makes it not super reliable is that there has been months where suddenly you know, AMD CPUs are now used 10% more than they were the previous month. And then the next month, 
it reverts back to normal than the following month. Intel CPUs are used 10% more than the previous month. And it's pretty obvious that with the size of the Steam install base, that you're not seeing that sort of fluctuation from month to month. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to get suddenly like 50 million more Intel CPU users in the space of one month mm-hmm. compared to AMD. Like it seems pretty un- unrealistic. And you see, you see then the graph goes back down the following month. So that doesn't seem, you know, particularly useful information to me. And then, you know, you look in depth at some of the the Steam hardware survey results, and often people are like, okay, well, we're going to use this to talk about Intel versus AMD, NVIDIA versus AMD. But you look into some of the stats, and I've just looked into some of these things, for example. So 8% of Steam users do not have an AVX2 supporting CPU. So that means that the CPU that they're using is probably over a decade old. Mm -hmm. I think both brands have supported AVX2 for that long. 14% 14% of Steam users have less than 2 gigabytes of VRAM, which means the majority of current games will not run on the, that sort of mm-hmm. card. And 29% only have a have four CPU cores or less, which again means that a significant number of games are probably getting pretty bad performance on these products. So They're playing indie titles and stuff. Yeah, it's like the, it's useful in some way for developers to sort of say, okay, I'm trying to make a game, I'm trying to target the widest audience, it's nice to know that 14% of users only have 2 gigabytes or less of VRAM, Mm -hmm. so if I want it to run on laptops and really old systems, which I'm assuming are those those users, that I can have like a super broad appeal game Mm -hmm. that can work on all those things. But if you want to be talking about like modern... Tr- up-to-date game systems that can run AAA games. So like, what are this? What's the percentage of Steam users that can run? I don't know. Like your Starfields, your Avatars, your Alan Wakes. Mm-hmm. Is it really relevant that fourteen percent of gamers have two gigabytes of VRAM or less? Like, how ca- how much can you read into the market share figures when fourteen percent of users literally cannot run those games? Well, Potentially as much as thirty percent with the four core CPUs. Yeah, and then you got four even four gig of VRAM is not really enough. Yeah, and there's so. significant portions of people that are clearly using you know fairly basic laptops. You can see the percentages of people using integrated graphics on there as well, which in you know is going to inflate mm-hmm. AMD and Intel C- GPU usage figures in some degree because they've got integrated graphics in their CPUs, which inflates those numbers. So yeah, when I see the Steam hardware survey, I think it's useful for developers. They need to know those things because it is going to be largely reflective of Steam users. But people often take that the, the next step and they go, you know, how many articles do we see about this yeah, yeah. this month? There's been, you know, Intel has improved their market share by 4% or AMD or NVIDIA has improved their market share. It's like, come on, guys. Is that mm. is that useful information? Is that is that accurate for what you're trying to portray in those articles, which is the the gaming market? I'm not sure. So, yeah, but I think in, I think Steam should change this the way the survey is run to just survey everyone. That would probably smooth out some of those weird fluctuations. Yeah, and just make it easy to opt out if you don't yeah, want to do it. Yeah, in the installer, just I honestly buttons. think I've been asked once in two years. Yeah, I've been asked once every so often, but certainly not every month. Mm-hmm. Like. And on test systems, I think it's pretty rare for me to get asked at all. Yeah. It's usually only on my main gaming system. So, yeah. All right. Tim has added in one of those questions that's very specific to an individual user, but I think well, it must have been heavily upvoted, and I'm, I've got an answer for it. So, sure, we'll go for it. it. Is it smart to upgrade to a 7800X 3D from a 5600X, so AM4 to AM5, or should I just wait for the next AMD CPU release? So right. you're basically building a new computer. Like it's a full mm-hmm. platform upgrade. You need new motherboard, new memory, new CPU. I don't want to answer this question at all. Not because I've got anything against <laughs> the person who asked the question because it's a, it, it depends. depends. How many times have we pulled that out so far? Yeah. It's been a few, it depends. Yeah. And it depends on, do you even, do you need to upgrade? Like uh, you're asking this sort of question, I suppose, because I have to assume that the 5600X is no longer meeting your needs, mm-hmm. or maybe you feel like it's not. I'm not 100% sure what the sort of the reasons are. But first of all, when it comes to an upgrade, you've really got to be like, well, I need to upgrade. The 5600X is, I find it hard to believe that CPU is not really performing in games. It's just still quite a good CPU. But let's just say you've concluded that the CPU is no good. You have to upgrade. Well, at that point, you have to upgrade. So what are the the viable upgrade options? And really the 700X3D is probably going to be the best upgrade option there. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, how much faster is it than a 5600X? Like 40%, 50% faster? It's one of those things where it, it it varies wildly. It can be more than 80%. Like it would be 100% faster. Yeah, but also it's, I'm assuming that this person has probably purchased a 5600X for less than the current price of the 7800X 3D. Absolutely. So sort of like could you wait another generation and potentially get that performance at a similar price to what you paid? And then Again, that that's it depends. It comes down to the individual... Are you willing to wait? Are you willing to wait? Yeah. How desperate are you for this upgrade? If the 5600X is mostly fine. You're just like, hmm, mm-hmm. this is pretty good, but it could be better. It's like, well. There's enough know, performance there that it, make, that it makes sense. You're not getting like 10 or 20% more performance, in which case it'd just be like, don't it, bother with that. And but where else? It also depends on the games you're playing. So if you're playing single player games, 1440p, mm-hmm. then the CPU upgrade's not going to be that significant for the most part. There will certainly be. Yeah, we're seeing very CPU limited games like Hogwarts Legacy, especially Rage Racing enabled, Starfield and stuff like that. So if the 5600X is only producing, I don't even know what it does in Starfield. I can't remember. You'd have to Mm -hmm. refer to some benchmarking there. But let's say it's just struggling with 60 FPS and you're really like, I need 90 FPS as my minimum. Then yeah, the upgrade will be worth it. And a 7800X 3D is a really good way to go there um, or... Mm-hmm. Maybe even a 7600, though it's less of a... Since you have to buy the motherboard, the memory and all that, spending a bit more on the CPU is probably pretty easy to justify there. And yeah, again, the games you play. If it's single-player games, probably less likely, but there's still a case to be made. If you're playing esports-type games, again, Apex Legends, Warzone, or just Call of Duty, Fortnite, and the list goes on and on and on... Um, counter-strike 2 for example and you want as many frames per second as possible you want to make sure your frame rate stays above 200 300 whatever it may be then again the cpu upgrade there is going to be worth it but yeah a lot of it depends (laughs) and really it depends on the individual how Mm -hmm. what it is they want to achieve Uh, and that's why testing cpus with high-end gpus and people complain about that it's 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 irrelevant because you really want to know what the CPU can deliver. How many frames can it deliver? Because if you want 200 frames, you need to know, can the CPU actually deliver 200 frames? You don't want to see it tested with the GPU that limits you to 150 FPS because that's just mm-hmm. useless. Anyway, that's a separate rant that I'm not going to go on with because we'll be here all day. Alrighty, Tim, as usual, we'll hit the pause button because we have a lot more to go through. But for... YouTube algorithm reasons. <laughs> we, we're doing them in what? What do we usually aim for? 20, 30 minute segments? Yeah, I think we're a bit of a slave to the algorithm there on that one. Well, yeah, the algorithm that's kind of just driven by the people who use YouTube. Yeah, the, the whole thing of like you make a two hour episode and people are like, hmm, I've seen 10 minutes of this and, and that's enough. But you split it up and people somehow watch more of it. It's magic. It's magic. I love it. It's a way we suck you guys in, but blame the algorithm. It's the algorithm. No, it's not our fault. No, it's it's YouTube. Blame them. Yep. So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed that. (laughs) More to come. (laughs) More to come. You can subscribe to our Patreon or Floatplane accounts if you want to support the channel. Get access to like monthly live stream, which potentially... Actually, probably not, but potentially will come out after these episodes come out, but probably not. Sign up straight away to find out. Just smash the subscribe button, hit that maximum donation tier or whatever. Maybe even go higher than that if there's an option. Do, so do that. Do a That'd custom be nice. donation. Do custom, yeah. Yeah, we'll get... <laughs> That'd be awesome. Anyway, live streams, Discord chat, BTS videos, priority Q&A access if you want to ask questions for these videos. And yeah, lots of good stuff. So that's it. I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Dave. We'll see you in the next one.